Often when I come and visit someone's car cave, you're greeted by not just an interesting garage structure with a decent story, but often quite a lot of cars. In this instance, there isn't a lot of cars in here, despite it being a big building, but the couple of cars that are in here are really extra special. Not even road legal, which is a bit odd. All will be revealed shortly. Of course, this is a car cave episode of The Late Break Show. I'm Johnny Smith. Hello, Steve. Johnny. <laughs> it's good to see you. And you. I've heard a lot about this place. I met Steve, I can't remember, I met you probably seven years ago, eight years oh, ago. Oh, longer than that, I think. You reckon ten years ago? Ten, ten, yeah, ten years plus, I should think. And I met him because of the car that's actually in the other room, but which we'll come on to, which that gives the little bit of game away. But why I wanted to come and do this, because the Car Cave series often show, it's, it's a celebration of the buildings, the sort of, the housing of the vehicles. Mm. And you haven't got that many cars, but what you've got is an incredible setup. And I know you, you built this place yourself, right? I did, yes. I built it about four years ago on the pretext of having a man cave. Yeah. And we've utilized part of it as that and part of it as my wife's business now. Okay. But I just find that what I've kept to myself is probably sufficient for what I do. I, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's an exercise of restraint in any garage that I go in where there's a lot of floor space. Mm. You've got enough space to bring in your, your lawn tractor, for example. I have, yeah. That takes, you, haven't, uh, you haven't crammed it no, full of stuff. No, I hate, I hate cramming. I'm not a, a hoarder. I like to have space and I like to see what I've got, put it in a place where I know it's going to be there next week. All right, so let's rewind a little bit then, Steve. Um, pre these vehicles, what's your car history? Uh, well, my very first car, when I was 17, was a 1968 Mark II Cortina 1600E. Oh, okay. Yeah, um, nice Cortina. <coughs> that's my very first car, which I wish I still had. Do you? Yeah, I do, because it was a lovely car, and they've just gone stupidly in value. Yeah. Um, and from then, I bought a 1966 Triumph TR4A yeah. IRS. Okay. And alongside that, I then bought a 1971 TR6. Okay, so you like your little sports cars. Yeah, I yeah. do. Um, and then I had a 1750, I know you're probably going to swear at me now, but I had 1750cc Allegro. Did you? Yeah. You twin carb. Oh, so hang on a minute. That was that's the big boy. That wasn't big the boy. SS, was no, it? No, no. TC. Wow. Okay. Yeah. That quite, is rare. Quite, quite a rare. Was yeah. it quick? Yeah, it was. For <laughs> for it for, a, for that sort of type of car. Yes, it was. Shock horror. Man that owns historic Formula One cars also used to own Hot Allegro. <laughs> <laughs> You're a builder by trade. I am. Which is why you built this building. I built this alongside my house. Yeah. Yeah. Because this is this would be my third house that I built for myself. And now um, I'm a man of leisure. Oh yeah, so you've wound, you've wound that up, but you've, you've you've built this place of worship. Yeah, and I it really is when you see next door. Yeah, it is. It's a place that I spend a lot of time. Oh, look at that. Watch, watch that um, wing. Oh um, yeah, yeah. Watch the. Yeah, you won't want to stand on that. Before we go into the the Formula One room, this is so far away from F1. Yes. And that's it's nearly as fast. Not as fast, but, but incredibly jolly. So what's the story with the Fiat 500? Well, it's a car that I've always pined over because of its, its, it's, it's a tiny little thing, probably yeah. too small for me. But yeah. at the end of the day, it's something that goes back to the past of my family being at my parents are Italian. Yeah. Um, my relations used to have these in Italy. Right. So I can remember when I was young, yeah. Bombing down to the beach with like 10 of us inside it. <laughs> and um, it's something that I've always hungered for, really. Yeah. And um, I, I did belong to the Fiat 500 Owners Club for a while. And then I acquired this one from um, over at Norwich, where a, a lady owned it from you. Really? And, yeah, one owner from you. Really? Wow. Yeah. Okay. And I see it's right hand drive. So right hand it's a, drive. It's a British car. Yeah, British car. And it was virtually perfect, but. It wasn't perfect enough for me, so I 
stripped it, rebuilt the engine, yeah. and rebuilt the whole car. Oh, did you? Yeah. You did heart. it? I did it myself, yeah. You got, you got to c come, come and have a look. Um, you've got to show me the engine on this because with the, with the picnic basket. But you, it was running fine, but like all these old cars, they had mechanical fuel pumps. Yeah. Uh, they used to have dynamo on the thing as well. Yeah. And they just were not reliable. And when I had it, it just kept breaking down, mostly because of the um, mechanical fuel pump issue. Yeah. So I rebuilt, rebuilt it completely, fitted an after, a, a sort of aftermarket kit, uh, alternator. Alternator. Yeah, mechanic, uh, electric fuel pump. Electric fuel, brilliant. And put on electric ignition as well. Made a world of difference. And it's reliable. I can drive it now every single day and it, doesn't, it does what it's meant to do. So you did, it does get used? Yeah, it gets it's used. It's not just yeah. an ornament? No, 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 it gets used. Only in the summertime. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At the end of the day, there's no, there's no uh, MOT. No. MOT free, because it's 1966. Yeah. Uh, there's uh, no road tax, and it's like eighty pound a year for insurance. Yeah. And it does ten thousand miles to a gallon. Yeah. <laughs> which is very different to your daily driver out there. Well, it is. Wh yes, which... but this is more for fun, really. And of course, when I do drive it, it's surprising how many people wave at you. I know. Everyone loves a five hundred. Yeah. Everybody, don't they? Nobody waves at me in the in the other one in no. the Merc, but this one. Yeah. People are waving and laughing yeah. and pointing and it's it's a bit of fun. It's a character. Yeah, it is. It's a it character. Is. And I love it. But you've got the big <clears throat> is that a is that an actual That's um, an original That's a dealer. An original dealer sign um sign. Bloody hell. Yeah. With Italian uh, electrics and everything. Yeah. So you have you owned and I know there's the cabinet I've just there. Owned I've owned probably 20 Ferraris. That many? Of my years, yeah. Most of them in that cabinet I've owned. Now, you might have noticed some two-wheeled machines. Uh, well, we have next to this kitchen, which is big, I remind Steve, it's bigger than my kitchen at home. <laughs> but this is the garage kitchen. We've got your, we've got your, your little, your Benetton pit bike here, <laughs> which, is, <laughs> which is cool. Uh, and there's bits of Suzuki on here, next to the Formula One wheel, because just, here, we'll come around to this one. So this is mid-restoration. Yeah. Suzuki. I do like restoring bikes. I can tell. Yeah. Yeah, well, I've been doing this for the last two years. Okay. Um, only because I've been doing some massive uh, project work on one of the race cars. Right. So, um, so it's in suspended animation. Yes, it is really. So hopefully this winter I'll get it complete. Yeah. So the engine's been rebuilt. Everything's been... Um, powder coated, re -chromed. I was going to say, you've polished a lot of this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've noticed that, well, we'll come over to these bikes because these two bikes, I think even if you don't appreciate motorbikes, you've got to appreciate the colors, the era mm. of these two. So that's a GT... That's a GT 250, 250. Ram Air 1975. Right, okay. Um, this one is a Laverda. 1979 Laverda Jota. This is the same age as me. <laughs> Because this particular model, the orange and the silver, is the most sought after color combination. Right. So the year of the bike is depicted by the colors. Really? Yeah. Okay. So you'd have a, you'd have a black, black paintwork with a gold frame. You'd have black paintwork with a silver frame, red paintwork with a silver frame. Different and years. So, on. so different years of the Jotas are depicted by the, the color combination. Wow, okay. And the silver and orange, 1979, was always the most sought after. Interesting. Yeah. The, the colour scheme on this Suzuki, now I wanted to call it a kettle. Would I be right in calling this yeah, a kettle? Yeah, they call it a kettle in the UK and they call it a water buffalo in America. <laughs> Do they? Yeah. I didn't yeah. know that. Water buffalo. And the reason why they called it the kettle is because it was water cooled. Water cooled. And it was, yep. is it, now is it a four or three? Three cylinders. It's a three, isn't it? 750. Yeah. It's a J model. So it was the first, the first version of the triple 750. Right, okay. Okay. It came with twin lead and front shoes. Right. So the little traits about it, which so, were different to the 72, 73 model. So drum front end. Yep. I'm loving the end caps on the rad being body coloured. Yes. It, oh, it's such a great mm. little covering with, the, with this crash bar. Yeah. Going around. Again, that, this, is, this has been a huge engine bike for its time. Yes. I mean, it's very slow. It's only 63 horsepower. Is it really? Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay, so a lot slower than that. Oh, yes. That's 100 horsepower. Okay. Which, again, is nothing to modern bikes. No, but 40, 
yeah. 40 odd years ago, you've rebuilt this? Yeah, rebuilt this one. And also, you, you can't deny it. There's something very cool about selective memorabilia that you've got. So that's where I, when I first met Steve and his car, his cars through there, that's where we were. We were at Carfest. So this is the main event, I suppose, of Steve's Car Cave, uh, the next room, which has not one, but two Formula One cars in. So come on, let's have a look. You lead the way, Steve. It's your den. Now, this is what I like. Yes, it's a, a, a B193. This is, this is a Benetton 193B, yeah. uh, which was used in 1993, uh, used by Michael Schumacher and Ricardo Patrese. Completely original. Wow. Uh, did five Grand Prix in its, in its day was used for qualifying by Michael Schumacher at the British Grand Prix. Yeah. And it uh, finished the race in third position with Petrese. And this car you've had for a while? I've had this car for 18 years, this, particular, it, this it, particular chassis. Have you? Yeah. I didn't realize it was that long, okay. But what I like about this is, there's two things that I immediately like about this. One, it's right next to your mower. <laughs> <laughs> Two, like we said before, a lot there's a lot of people that have got old Formula One cars out there, but they're mostly bought as ornaments. You know, they're rolling chassis that don't have the engine, the drivetrain in, they don't function. But how I met you was basically like this. You you were prepping the car to run it. Mm. So, yeah. and I think you must be the only builder in the world that also drives old Formula One cars. <laughs> Unless you don't have another one. I may be, I'm not sure about that. Fact. But it's not just, you know, obviously you, you, you're a builder by, by trade, but you actually work on this car, yes, these cars as well. And this is, this, look at this. Look, what an amazing, you roll the shutters up of, of, of what is a, you know, a well put together farm building. And the last thing you're expecting when you've got fields and Somerset scenery is this. Your, it's your own pit garage. It is. It is my own pit garage. I don't have a pit tart. <laughs> <laughs> so ninety nine. Let me get this right because my I'm not a Formula One expert, yeah. Stephen. I know this is your okay. this is your era. Nineteen ninety two, ben, Benetton Ford came third in the championship. I believe I so. And then yeah. going into ninety three, which is where these two cars are, because that's the thing. There's two of them. Yeah. Um. This was Schumacher's first season. No. No? No. Second season? His first season was 1990, 1990 with Jordan. Was it 90? 1990, okay. Jordan right. a Jordan. Yeah. And then he uh, did one, basically did one race with Jordan and then was stolen by Benetton. Right. So in 1990, 91, he joined Benetton. Yeah. And had his first season with Benetton, had his first win in 1991 at, at Spa. Right. With the 191. Yeah. Then went on to drive the 192 with Martin Brundle right. as his partner. Right. And he and in the 94 season, he ended up winning the championship. He won the championship in 94, yeah. Why, why this era of F1 car? What, what does it do for you? Well, it's kind of the last of the true V8. And in terms of owning the car, it's the last of the era where you can actually look after it yourself. Really? Um, as, as the time went on, they became more and more problematic in terms of um, ECU software, yeah. you know, and it became very, very problematic to run. Yeah. Where this year, or up to sort of 1994, 95, yeah. really was the last ones where Joe Public could kind of run them without having a massive F1 team behind them. Because when you, when you run this thing... Yeah. You do need people with you. You can't yeah, you do. really do it. On your no, own. you can't. You can't. You can't do it on your own. No. Yeah. So you basically, in in period, they used to use two two laptops to run the car. Okay. Um, one was basically for the engine. Yeah. And the second laptop was all for the uh, driver aids on the car because this car was packed with driver aids. It was the most sophisticated car in the nineties, where a nineteen ninety two was basically an H section H box. Oh yeah, this was the first of the paddles. First of the paddles, of yeah. Of course. Yeah. 
So a 92 H box, no driver aids, no traction control, nothing, just a bare souped up go-kart <laughs> And in 93, uh, even though the cars look the same in terms of color, there is no, there is no comparison in the, two, in the two cars. Okay. So they brought in the, the wheelbase was narrowed, the, the width, okay. different size wheels, yeah. different body work. And then they brought in all the driver aids. This car had launch control, traction control, rear wheel steer at the end of the season. They also expanded with power steering, wow. active suspension, and all the other bits and pieces that they experimented with. So this was a spaceship? It was in the 90s, yes. Yeah, there was yeah. nothing else like it. Wow. If somebody's watching this going, how do you actually go about buying a, an older Formula One car? What's the process? Are there um, dealers? There Is are there... dealers. Yeah. Um, but most of the dealers now are only selling show cards. Okay. Because the, the time now of being able to acquire a fully functional race car yeah. with history has gone by the board. Has it? Because everybody has realized what value these cars are yeah. and snapped them all up. So it's provenance is always key with this stuff. Provenance, originality. And functionality. Yeah. How, how do you go about driving a Formula One car? Because if, you, if you're someone uh, up until this point, you've owned, you've owned some Ferraris, mm. you've ridden motorbikes. This is a new realm for you. Surely you've got to be a bit nervous. <laughs> yeah, I you, was a bit nervous. You've been in a fortunate position where you've managed to buy an old Formula One car, but now you've got yeah. to not crash it. No, the very first time I drove this car, I was asked to drive it at the uh, Silverstone Classic. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Okay. <laughs> exactly. Tin, Winky. teeth wide apart. Winky bum. Thinking, blimey. And I was out on track with about 12 other cars. Right. And I was pretty green. Yeah. And um, at the end of the day, I, I managed to pull away without stalling. Okay. Which was one of the most difficult things to do with these cars. I've heard, yeah. You, you'll have to stay tuned because we're going to start this car up later. Um, Steve's going to run us through the, the procedure because there's obviously quite a big procedure with the car like this. And we're very fortunate enough to be able to fire it up, which can't wait to do. Um, let's, look at, let's look back here because obviously it's pretty cool to have one, even cooler to have two. Um, what's the story with this one? So this is, the, this is the, the Schumacher car, right? This car, the 193C, driven by Michael. It had rear wheel steer and it had the new latest air valve engine, right. which went on to be evolved in 1994 to become the Ford ZTEC, which Michael then won the championship. Wow, okay. So, so this engine in here is completely original. It's a Ford HB air valve. Yeah. There aren't any others in the world. Really? No, this is the, this is the only one, <sighs> completely original. And it runs? And it runs. Because you've had it, that, the story behind how Steve found this car, I think, is really fascinating. So, you already own this. I own that car. I'm guessing you weren't actively looking for another Formula One car. Maybe you were. No, I, I, well, I, I was and I wasn't. I didn't really want to have another car of the same ear and same colours and same so on. Yes. I wanted something different, of a different era. Yeah. Maybe driven by a different driver. But um, At the end of the day, I was looking for something, but a guy came up to me at an event and just basically said, I got one of those at home. And I sort of said something in a polite way. And yeah. he, kept, he kept coming back and saying, I've got one of those, I've got one of those. So as time went on, he sent me some photographs and I thought, oh, it looks like, looks like mine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So he invited me to his house. I'd look at the car. There are some little, little parts of the cars that the general public wouldn't know about. Yeah. which can prove the providence of the car. So I knew where these bits were. So I started taking bits off at his home. And he started saying, what are you doing? What are you doing? I said, no, I mean, I'm just checking it over. Yeah. So I removed certain bits, found these original markings, yeah. which said to me, this is real Toshia. McCoy. And I knew that Chassis 5 was the most successful car in, in 93. Wow. Okay. So I tried to purchase it from him, but he wouldn't sell it. Oh, okay. okay. And then eventually, after many, many years, we did the deal. And, many um, years? Yeah, many years. Okay. Yeah. 
And this car lived in a very unusual place. It did. It lived in his very large house. Yeah. And it, um, it lived upside down, hanging from a ceiling in his cinema room. So when you did the deal, did you have to get it out of the house? Yeah, which was a performance because it wouldn't fit for the door. And was it, was it a complete car at that No. Point? Gearbox was in, but no engine. So you had to find that? Yeah, we had to find that engine, yeah. I don't want to know how much an engine no, like that would cost. not going to tell you either. Aren't you? No. You're going to give us a ballpark? <laughs> <laughs> give me... I just, I'm just curious. It's got a naught in it, put it that way. <laughs> right, okay. Is it quite a small group of people that have these cars and actually... Well, these are the only two in the world. There aren't any, there aren't any others of these running. Really? No, there are no other 193Bs in the world running. And you've got two that I've got aren't... two of them, yeah. Wow. 1992 cars, they're quite a lot running. Okay. Because they built nine chassis. Right. In 1993, then we built four chassis. Because you want to, we want to start this car up, because, you know, it's a car cave. I normally go out and drive one of the, the cave owner's vehicles. We won't be driving this today, but we will be uh, firing it up. I don't know how to fire a Formula One car up, and I, I presumed you'd have five or six people. Um, you wouldn't actually need that many. I okay. mean, you, you would have that many in terms of a race team because they'd yeah. be one on each corner and they don't have their own little job. Yeah. But for what we're doing today, we only need two people. Okay. One on the starter, one to look at a laptop. So we're looking to get the engine to about 65 degrees before we actually turn the engine over. Because in its cold state, the engine would virtually be seized. Really? Yeah. Okay, so that you, you plug this in before you turn it. Yeah, we, we plug this in, we, get, we start to get the temperature into the engine. It takes about an hour, hour and a half. And once we're at the temperature, then we're able to turn it over, get our oil pressure correct, get all the system pressures correct, then we're able to turn it over and fire it. Awesome. So when you bought the car, be honest, mm. were you um, blissfully unaware of the scale of the maintenance or um, you, you were aware? I kind of was a little bit naive to it all, like, yeah. you, like you would be with anything that's new to you. Yeah. But as time goes on, with, with knowledge from people in Formula One yeah. who helped me out, um, you just come to realise how complex it is, but also how simple it is. Well, that's it then. We're going to go for a lunch break. And by the time we come back, all its blood will be warm and we can hopefully wheel it out. Okay, so um, Steve and his son, Janu, are just about to bring the, uh, the car out to do the fire-up procedure. It's, it's up to temperature. We've changed into team clothing because it's an official fire-up. Uh, Steve had a rummage around in his cupboard and he's actually got a new old stock. Benetton manager's jacket. Blazer, blazer, not even a jacket. So, behold. They will be firing the hole shortly. Yeah. It's very important that the manager gets to see. Ready? Yeah. Okay. I can't believe the amount of heat mm. it gives off, even on basically on idle. I know. That's absurd. It does get a bit hot. Is it? And that was only 80 degrees. Was it? Yeah. Christ. Normally those exhaust pipes will glow orange. Well, I mean, it's as hot as an oven from here. Mm. That was, I mean, I took the ear defender off one ear just to give it a bit of a sound check. And obviously I'm, I'm not facing the exhaust. That was loud. That was very, very, very cool. Very cool. Well. Uh, thank you, you guys, for uh, for letting me come and visit your cave. That's uh, that's brilliant. Well, I really hope you enjoyed this episode of the Late Break Show. A really special car cave. I think you'll all agree. Thanks to Yano and Steve. Um, 
I've had a great time. This is probably the first, maybe the last time I'll ever get to fire up a, a historic Formula One in somebody's back garden. Um, if you haven't already subscribed, please subscribe. Uh, why not support us via Patreon if you want to? I'll put a link in the description for that. There's also a link in there for merchandise. Although sadly, we don't sell new old stock 1993 Benetton managerial blazers, but maybe in the future we will.